let me adjust this. Okay. Hi, welcome back to Relationship Stuff, where I, Dr. Angelica Shields, talk to you about all things relationships. Whether it's your relationship with your microphone that you need to gently move, <laughs> whether it's your relationship with yourself, your relationship with your people, your relationship with something like discipline or exercise or spending, here's where we talk about all that. And we don't talk about rules and shoulds and should nots. We talk about that flexible, dynamic dance of being in an actual relationship. <laughs> I'm gonna do a little story time. The other day I was talking to a really close friend whose husband was going through some really terrifying medical issues recently. They didn't know if it was Lyme, they didn't know if it was an autoimmune issue, lupus, they didn't know if it was related to mold, but he was really going through some debilitating physical symptoms from head to toe and just completely exhausted. It was hard to live and it was really affecting his mental health as well, of course. Fast forward, he tries all the medication, gets all the tests, gets opinion after opinion after opinion. Finally, what he does is, and he's not really religious, but his wife described it as, I guess, Angelica, he just gave it to God or just said, okay, I'm gonna feel this way and I'm gonna have my life anyway. I'm going to take it one step at a time, but I'm not gonna limit myself and say no. I'm gonna get up and watch the show. I'm going to walk my dog and if I can only make it five steps, I'm gonna make five steps. I am going to be more expansive, more open to possibilities while I'm feeling the horrible way that I'm feeling. And when she told me that, uh, can you imagine? She was all casual about it, but I was like, that is the most inspiring thing I've ever heard. I've heard that type of story before, but maybe just knowing the person, it would just hit me. To be so brave to make that choice. And I was thinking to myself, I asked her as the wife, do you think it was the fact that when he decided to give it to the universe or live a life while he was in pain, do you think that that just coincided with him getting rid of all the mold in you guys' house? And that was really what made him get better? or Because he actually did get better. Um, or do you think it was that psychological shift from the wife's perspective? Like, what's your best guess? What, what do you think made the biggest impact? And she was like, I don't really know, but definitely the psychological shift was huge. Like, she was kind of like, my money's more on the psychological shift, but maybe the maybe the mold removal made a difference. Like, cause she's, she's, she had the inside day-to-day -day scoop up close and personal. So that was her guess. And I was thinking to myself, besides the fact that I was like, how brave, oh my gosh. I couldn't stop pondering how applicable this is to so many aspects of mental health and health and life. Deciding, making a choice to live your life side by side with your pain sounds weird. It sounds dismissive almost. It sounds almost like invalidating. Like, I am sick and tired of people telling me that my pain is in my head and I should just act like it isn't there. It's probably very triggering to suggest such a thing, not to mention it just sounds cruel to suggest such a thing to somebody who's dealing with debilitating pain. It's like, go walk your dog anyway, have a life anyway. I don't know without some profuse validation and developing of a really strong foundational relationship, I don't know how skilled I would be with pulling off that suggestion with somebody that I didn't know very, very well and hadn't cultivated a deep relationship with. And I think that's one of the reasons why a deep relationship and therapy is really important because the person has to hear some hard things and still feel like they're being taken seriously and, and they're not being dismissed. But I was thinking with depression, with anxiety, some of this treatment resistant depression and anxiety, I have seen people try all the T's, the CBT, the ACT, the DBT, the, all the programs and just go all in, watch all the videos, do all the workbooks. Really, I have, as some of these people who have more of like an Asperger's-y kind of disposition, neurological composition, and they take it very, very seriously and they're not getting better. They're on the medication. They're not getting better. A couple of these cases, I have seen 
the despair that I, okay, I have a choice. The, the choice that I'm not going to say on YouTube or I live with this without resisting it moment by moment by moment. I consciously make a commitment every moment that it occurs to me, every moment I need to recommit. So maybe 20 times a minute, I consciously, bravely, courageously recommit to being in this moment side by side with my feelings, side by side with my emotion or my physical feeling or whatever it is. And I've seen those people, I mean, I, I'll say I can count them on one hand, but I've seen it up close and personal and they've gotten better. I can't pretend to know the neurology behind it. I can make guesses and I we've talked about it in depth and you could probably connect the dots yourself, not being a psychologist, I mean, just being a human. Some of that forward momentum and that hope and that, that energy that you now have in your brain that you're not, you're not spending that time resisting and fighting, some of that is life affirming and expansive and it, it snowballs into one day you just wake up and you have a life. I think there's something to that. You start dipping your toe in the water in terms of expanding your life to having more experiences, more relationships, taking more risks. You have to. I mean, if you, if you made a decision to be in your life with the pain, you might be like, okay, I guess I'm gonna go to the brewery tour. I'm, it's something stupid like that. Maybe drinking wasn't a good example, but I'm gonna go on the hike. I guess I'm gonna go take the pottery class. You know, and you find yourself in more situations that are life affirming. So maybe that's part of it. But, but what I'm saying, just like the pain of my friend's husband, depression and anxiety are real. They are very dangerous and very real and very convincing mind games. And you can't just say, oh, pretend it's not there. It's there. And it's dangerously there for a lot of people. The choice, the active choice to be in a moment while it's there side by side, have it in the passenger seat and not the driver's seat and to feel the things while you're doing a diff different thing. That's why I keep saying it's so courageous because doesn't it sound nuts? But the choice to do that, and sometimes people make that choice out of desperation, is what fuels a dissipation in some of the very, very real symptoms. There's research on chronic pain, and you probably don't need to be a psychologist to know this, but there's actual research on chronic pain, which is the more you attend to the pain, the more you actually feel real, not imagined, not in your head, actually feel more intense pain. The more you think about it, the more you try to manage it the more you basically go toward it in your moment and make your make your moment about that with your focus, the more you put a spotlight on it, the more intense it feels. They've done really tight research on that and it's been replicated several times. It's a sticky thing to talk to somebody about because sometimes people, people who are in so much pain, they hear like your pain's not real, which is not it at all. It's a sticky thing to encourage somebody to make a conscious choice to have their life side by side with the pain and see what happens. So that got me thinking. I was thinking about that in terms of mental health. I was thinking about that in terms of specifically anxiety and specifically sleep. Sleep, pain, and anxiety. All three of those processes in the mind and body are called paradoxical processes. And the reason they're called paradoxical is because a paradox is something that you wouldn't expect to go the way that it goes. It goes contrary to what you're trying to make happen. And the paradox for this stuff is the more you try to make yourself sleep, the more you're gonna have trouble sleeping. The more you try to manage your anxiety and put a spotlight on your anxiety, the more your brain is gonna be coming up with anxious stories and, and your nervous system is gonna be in hypervigilance mode, giving your body and mind cues of danger. The more you put a spotlight on the pain, the more you're going to be immersed in that pain experience. The smaller and more narrow your life is gonna be and the more expansive the pain is gonna be. So all three of those things, the anxiety, the sleep, and the pain are paradoxical processes. Have you ever had a big meeting a really important interview or something like that. And you're like, oh God, I get a good, good night's sleep tonight. You know, you go to bed early, you get all tucked in, you have your tea, whatever. And all you do is stare at that dang clock. Pretty soon it's midnight. 
pretty soon it's 3 a.m. You're staring at the clock and every time you look at the clock and it's now 3.20, it's now 3.25, you get more and more tense and more and more fixated on, I have to sleep, I have to sleep. Oh my gosh, I have that big meeting tomorrow. I have to be well rested. The more and more your body is vigilant and not sleepy at all. Most people have experienced that, whether you have a parasomnia or not, because all humans have that paradoxical relationship with those three things. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a disorder. All humans have a paradoxical relationship with sleep anxiety and pain. Is it a coincidence that the same people that struggle deeply with that anxious neurology, that neurology that makes a very convincing story or a very convincing what if, or very much wants order in the world to feel safe, and, and maybe tends to fixate on things in order to create that order or to anticipate the future, is it a surprise that that neurology often goes hand in hand with sleep disorders and often goes hand in hand with chronic pain. The same people that have that neurology, that's that anxious neurology, that's extra sensitive to the paradoxical effect that whenever you put constraints or like management mode or you try to make a thing not be, whenever you try to make yourself not worried about the thing or not think about that thing, certain brains think about it even more, the anxious brain. Is it a surprise that that type of brain, that person with that type of brain and nervous system often also struggles with sleep? And is it a surprise that that type of person, if they get an injury or if they have a health ailment, they feel it in a real way. I'm not saying it's all in their head at all, but they feel it in a more prolonged way and more deeply. Is it a surprise that sometimes the chronic pain and the sleep goes hand in hand with the anxious neurology? All three of those are paradoxical. Resolving these issues starts with something that feels very, very, very scary to certain neurology, to that rigid, anxious, um, easily spinning up a story and what ifing and managing the future and that kind of neurology. It starts with a scary, terrifying thing, which is opening yourself up to the possibility that you could commit to saying F it. And then two seconds later, you could have that tight, tight, no, 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 I gotta sleep, I gotta sleep, or oh my God, my leg is hurting me, it's hurting me again, it's hurting, hurting me again. 20 seconds later, commit again, F it. What do I wanna do? I wanna watch this show. I wanna listen to this song. I wanna have this conversation with my sister. I wanna take a walk slowly because my leg is killing me. But I'm gonna, damn it, I'm gonna take a walk. You opening yourself to the possibility that you could do that. I hope that doesn't sound dismissive. I know how crazy that sounds, especially to certain neurology, but that's gonna slowly make your life more expansive and less fear-based and more exposure to, maybe I don't need to manage this. Some of the best sleep advice is, I'm just gonna go through it with you, and you can apply it to pain and you can apply it to anxiety, but it all is really honoring the fact that sleep is paradoxical. Some of the best sleep advice is you don't need to sleep eight hours a day, nine hours a day. Even if you have a big meeting the next day, the most important thing is not make yourself sleep, make yourself sleep. The most important thing is you have a bed available to you for let's say a reasonable number of hours. If you're not sleeping at all, let's say six hours, you have a bed available to you and you are not going into that bed until you are sleepy. There's a difference between sleepy and urgently thinking you want, you need to sleep. Sleepy is sleepy. You know what sleepy feels like my head's hitting the pillow and I'm actually going to fall asleep. And some people don't feel sleepy even if they have a big, especially if they have a big meeting the next day or their, their body and brain and their nervous system are in hypervigilant mode, they won't feel that way until two or 3 a.m. Better to wait until you're sleepy and just know that bed is available to me and then mosey on into the dark bed at that two or 3 a.m. There's not this urgency of, I have to get to bed, I have to get to bed. You're gonna go find something to do until you are sleepy and just know that that bed is available to you. How's that for paradoxical? You're literally intentionally not making yourself go to sleep. It's crazy, right? Okay, so that is some of the best advice. The quantity is not as important as the quality. And I think rigid people are like, I should sleep this much. I need to sleep this much. And the cognitive behavioral part of it is you could be crabby. 
and you could be tired the next day. You got that big meaning and you could mess up a couple of your words and you could be a little sluggish and you could miss a slide and you could wear a navy blue sock and a black sock because your brain is a little wackadoodle because you only slept three hours, but you actually slept three hours, right? Instead of the person that's like just trying to make themselves sleep and they only sleep one hour. Um, but you could have that happen the next day and you don't want to catastrophize. That's the, the cognitive behavioral therapy. Watch your thoughts about that. Watch your story about that. Lean into the possibility. Open yourself up to the possibility that you could have this bad stuff happen. The blue sock and the black sock. The blubbering your words in the presentation. The making mistakes. And you could still have a good life. You could still have a good day. In fact, you could commit yourself to having a good day. Number one predictor of having a good day is setting your intention on having a good day. When you walk in the door after a hard day of work, number one predictor of having a good night is setting your intention on having a good night. I'm not talking about sleep, I'm talking about mood in general. Not how bad of a day you had, it's a mindset, it's a channel you, you set in your brain, it's a commitment you make to yourself. And guess what, you could have three hours of sleep three hours of quality sleep, that's really great for some people. You could have only three hours of sleep, wake up the, the morning of your interview, look yourself in the mirror, say, I'm gonna have a kick-ass day. I'm gonna have a really great day. Or I'm gonna feel tired, and I know I'm gonna feel tired, and I'm going to commit to being in my moment nevertheless. Not ruminating about how I shouldn't be, and I need to res resist, and why am I so tired, and ruminating and perseverating on that. But instead, I'm gonna commit to orienting my thinking to the present, to possibility and openness and I'm gonna have a good day anyway sound gaslighty I don't know some gaslighting of, of yourself is actually really helpful it's called cognitive behavioral therapy you set your intention on a different track you set your attention on a different core belief your core belief might be a little distorted like if I only get three hours of sleep my whole life you know it feels like I'm gonna lose my job and everybody's gonna hate me and I'm gonna have a miserable miserable day so you could apply that to the chronic pain there will be moments on a scale of one to ten of eight to 10 of pain for some people. Same with tiredness or fuzziness when you haven't gotten a good night's sleep. There will be moments, there will be stretch, hour stretches of it being an eight to a 10 on a scale of one to 10. Lean into that, accept it, surrender to it, give it to God as my friend said. See what happens, accept it in the passenger seat, like this is part of a life and I'm gonna still have my moment nevertheless alongside it. I'm gonna commit to that and then I'm gonna recommit to that. See what happens, okay. That was a big one. I hope that helps you. And if you know somebody that needs to hear this video, shoot it to them. And I thank you very much. Have a great day.